This is October 23rd, 2001. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates, and we're privileged to have with us today Haskell Sachs. Welcome to, uh, to our library, sir. And I understand they call you Huck. That is correct. May I call you Huck? You certainly may. Very good. And, and where were you born? <clears throat> Born in Boston. And when? In, uh, well, I was born in 17th of December, 1918. 1918, and your current address? <coughs> Falmouth, Massachusetts. Okay, and I believe you told me a minute ago that you moved from Natick uh, three months ago? About three and a half months ago. But you right. had lived here for many, many years? 47 years. And don't you see a lot of changes in the place? Oh, I, some beautiful changes, actually. I think the town itself has made a, uh, a stride upward. The population hasn't increased in those years, but the uh, beauty of the town now is just a beautiful thing to see. Oh, that's, that's very nice to hear. What is your uh, current marital status? <clears throat> Married, same woman, 54 years. And do you have children? Four. And grandchildren? 16. <laughs> oh, let's try it again. <laughs> how, how about great-grandchildren? None. Sixteen grandchildren. Sixteen grandchildren. You've, you've had a good life. And you were born in Boston. Were you raised in Boston? I was raised in Boston, Beachmont, Dorchester, Mattapan, Brookline. Those are all suburbs of Boston. All the area of Immediate Boston, communities. Yeah. And then how did you get out to Natick? Uh, let's see, we originally uh, moved to Natick. We wanted our children to have a little bit of the country. And we moved to Natick, and then we had a store in Natick, in Framingham originally. <clears throat> and uh, from Framingham, we branched out into other, other parts. Uh, and Natick, uh, we moved into a house in Natick. We thought we'd be there five years. We ended up being there 47 years. A little difference. And, uh, the town has been a lovely town, and we've enjoyed the town. Tell us about your family background, uh, your parents. My parents were both born in Boston, lived in North End. My dad was a, uh, worked in a uh, clothing store and was a boxer, a professional boxer. Mother was a housekeeper, and uh, they lived in uh, all these towns. And then the Depression struck. They had just bought a house in Mattapan, <coughs> and the Depression struck, and the, it was a two-family house, and the party upstairs lost his job. He couldn't pay the rent. My father was making a minimum wage, and he couldn't make the payments of the house, <coughs> and the house was foreclosed, and they lost the house, and they moved into an apartment in Brookline. That's where I, I my sister and I were raised, mostly there. And from there, uh, we went to Brookline schools. And then I was drafted uh, in the first uh, draft out of the town of uh, Brookline. I was in the first draft. That was in 1941. So you, 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 you went to school in, in, in Brookline? Brookline? Yes. And uh, you're talking about now, uh, if you were born in 1918, uh, the war in Europe broke out in 39. So you were 21 years old then. Um, w at, at the time you were going through high school, um, the, the war had not yet started then in That's Europe. That's correct. But immediately after, what did you do when you got out of high school? I worked for a uh, newspaper <clears throat> called the Boston Transcript. Oh, uh, yes. Not many people know that paper. But an old uh, paper there. My uncle was a circulation uh, in the circulation department, and I, I also worked there. And my job was delivering newspapers, but not, not to homes. I would uh, take a bundle of papers and drop five off at Inman Square and six off at Harvard Square and so forth. And uh, at that time, the, there was no, I paid nothing on the streetcars as I was carrying papers. and. Uh, then I took a job working for a, uh, he was a, um, a jobber of uh, linoleum products, floor products, heavy rolls. At that time, my wages were $12 a week. And uh, on Saturday, 
we worked until noontime, and we got an extra dollar. And for that dollar, it was downtown Boston, and for that dollar, we'd go to Chinatown and have a great big sumptuous meal for 35 cents, and all the fellows, we all worked there, and we enjoyed it, and then we'd take the streetcar back home to Brookline. So you were in that transitional period where the depression was still evident, but just before the wartime economy set in. That's correct. So for a dollar, you could really buy something. Oh, money but was a whole different A answer. lot of people didn't have dollars. Well, I, I can tell you another classic story. Uh, I owned a car, well, four of us owned this car together, partners. <clears throat> it was an Essex. I don't know if you ever heard of an Essex. And through my uncle's friend who ran the trucks for the Boston Transcript, I had a charge account at his gasoline station. My bill at the end of the month might be as much as $4, because gasoline, he, he, I, <clears throat> he, I, uh, I paid 10 cents a gallon for gasoline. At that time, by the way, gasoline everywhere was eight gallons for a dollar. That wasn't too uncommon, but I paid 10 cents a gallon. So as I said, at the end of the month, I owed him sometimes as much as three and four dollars for the month. So your work on Saturday brought you 10 gallons of gas. That's about it. Very That's interesting. It. Well, was, there, was there a draft in effect at this time in the United States? Yes. The draft you were subject to being drafted? Yeah, the subject being drafted and, and Brookline. I was in Brookline then and I was in the first draft out of the town of Brookline. And you were caught as they say, in the draft. I was in the draft. And, and uh, you went into the military services of the United correct, States. Yeah. When did you go in? I went in, in um, I forget the exact date, but it was February 1941. I could have stayed out. I had, a, I had, a, had, a, I had an operation on my leg, a pretty severe operation on my leg called osteomyelitis. And I had to get uh, see a doctor to get the okay to go into the service. My leg was good, actually, but I had no trouble with it at all. So you went into the services uh, February uh, 10 months before, before Pearl before Harbor. Before Pearl Harbor, that's correct. And did you have any choice as to which service you would go into? Not really. It was the Yankee Division I went into. It was a, it was a, I was drafted into a National Guard outfit which was located, I think the National, National Guard was out of uh, Malden, Massachusetts. And I went into that outfit there with a lot of other selectees and uh, we joined that outfit. And then our uh, basic training, uh, this was the Yankee Division at that time. But you were absolutely, it was the Army or nothing else? Yeah. That's you never had a shot at uh, Navy? Well, no, or I did. I had a, a chance to go in the Air Force. I tried to get in the Air Force, but uh, I was turned down, believe it or not, my blood pressure was too high at that time. But I, uh, otherwise I survived the other years, so. But anyway, uh, I went into the Army and, and in the infantry, and then our basic training was at uh, Camp Edwards in uh, Cape Cod. And uh, from there uh, we, uh, from there we, became the, uh, it was the 26th Division at that time, and then eventually it became the AmeriCal Division. Tell us, tell us about basic training that in, basic, 19, in the early part of training, 1941. Okay, basic training, uh, we didn't have real rifles at that time. We had um, wooden Sticks, pieces yeah, and yeah. so forth. They didn't have any rifles to us, but it was rigorous training. And it was, uh, it was a lot of activity and, and good movement. We stayed at the Army barracks, of course. When you went into the service, did you go in alone, or were there other people that you knew from Brookline with you? Uh, actually, no, I really didn't you know. You were all by yourself? I was by myself, really. And, and did, of course, it, was it at Edwards, did you take any kind of test uh, to determine what your role would be in the military service? Not really, no. no. We How did you arrive at what you eventually did? Well, I think, that I, if I remember correctly, there really wasn't a, uh, uh, there was no problem to define where you, where you want to go. You just went the way they assigned you, and I was assigned the infantry, and I just accepted it. And 
And how long were you at Edwards? Uh, we were at Edwards, uh, went on, let's see, Edwards probably, I would say probably until about, uh, until about uh, August. At that time we started training, then we moved down south, down to uh, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina rather, uh, part of the outskirts of Fort Bragg. And we set up our uh, big Bramwell tents there, lived in our tents there, and had maneuvers down there also. Had you ever been out of Massachusetts before or traveled? Oh, I probably went to New York once, maybe, or something like but that. But now you're in the South, and, no, and, and uh, the South. was this an awakening to you, or did you well, find I, it? Well, I, I enjoyed the South, really. We had a lot of free time, and, and the weekends we were off, and uh, don't forget, the war wasn't on then. And weekends we were off, and we'd go to, the, to these small little towns, and it was, it was sort of a revelation to us that there's another part to the world. And uh, it was a... Nice. I enjoyed it very much. My mother, my mother and sister drove down while I was there to see me, and I had no idea. One day, they, I was at camp, and they said, um, "Sachs, you know, someone here to see you." And my mother and sister were there, and it was pretty nice to see them. I can remember old newsreels, or remember seeing newsreels when I was older, younger. Uh, of training in those days, and guys walking around with sticks, literally sticks, yeah, and true. a truck would drive by, and on it it said, this is a tank. Did you experience any of this, the, we the, had, the we total did. lack of the uh, prepared oh, yeah. military? Absolutely. I, I, I think that, uh, I think in a way they were practicing us to become an army. I mean, they, we were part of the the school itself, and uh, they actually wanted us to, uh, I don't know, I think that in a way that we had to learn, but they had to learn also. There was no, uh, our officers were just like we were, who were just suddenly uh, uh, National Guard officers, and the National Guard at that time was very, very lax and not the least bit prepared, so I think in this era, this, they were sort of gearing up for a potential war. I think it's difficult for people to remember the pre-Pearl Harbor era where America really didn't, was totally unprepared, didn't have an army to speak of, and you were part of it. Yeah. And now tell us about Pearl Harbor comes. Where were you? Well, I, I at that time I was on, uh, at Camp Edwards, and it was a weekend break. You, you came back up to Edwards? Yeah, we came back yeah. up to Edwards. It was a weekend break, and we were at a restaurant about, uh, oh, about five or six of my friends. At that time, you always, since you're all together, you, your, your friendship was comprised of fellows that you were in touch with all the time and became friendly with them and so forth. So we are having lunch in this restaurant, and all of a sudden the radio was blaring music on it. That we announced that there was a, and we just, look at each other and figure, well, this will be over inside of a couple of months, maybe as much as six months. And then uh, the awareness and strength of it hadn't dawned on us yet until, until this... Uh, and then a very interesting thing happened. Then we were assigned, our office was assigned to shore patrol in New Hampshire, and we were guarding the beaches against invasion of submarines and so forth. What, what, if anything, did you know about the Japanese military? Uh, Absolutely nothing. What did you know about the Japanese culture or the people themselves? I knew that the Japanese were, of, uh, in my opinion, I thought they were a fairly bright, uh, bright uh, class of people. Uh, also, they, they, they made a lot of, uh, at that time, uh, the Japanese made a lot of things for import into this country, but they're mostly on the toy basis. Mm -hmm. There were toys with Japanese toys. Not, I don't remember any Japanese radios or things like that. But uh, toys and uh, some, I never saw any clothing from Japan, but a lot of uh, small hardware pieces. None, nothing mostly on junk. a technical basis, yeah. but on a... Uh, You're up in New Hampshire, and now suddenly you're, you're looking for 
uh, not necessarily Japanese, but German uh, Oh, German, submarines. particularly, yeah. yeah. yeah what right. kind of training did you get to walk up and down beaches? Keep getting sand in your shoes, that's all. We yeah, kept, that's, at that time, we yeah. did have rifles assigned to us. We had O3s. O3s are a bolt action rifle. Five shots. And, uh, what's that? Five shots. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, we walked up and down the beaches, and of course, we never saw anything. And then uh, we shipped out. Uh, we were living in a, in a Morley button factory. I remember that very clearly. Our, our, uh, our accommodation was sort of uh, not quite pristine, but they were very functional. And uh, we had army cots there, and food was okay. We had army grub and so forth. We were on shore patrol for about a month. And then our outfit. Our name change came, our name was called Americal Division. Mm -hmm. And I think it maybe it was American Caledonia. I'm not really sure why it was Mer Americal Division. And uh, This is the only division without a number, I think, in, in yeah, the one whole of the few, war. I, I, yeah, so I gather. And uh, You were called together and told you were going to be shipped out? Yeah. That's had you gotten meant. to see your family at all? Yes, we yeah. did. Yes, we did. We, I had, a break. I'm not even sure it was a legal break. I think we may have just scooted out. I don't remember really. I think where they did give us a break, and we went home and said our fond farewells. And uh, and where did we, you go? Figured be home in a few months. That's all. You you still figured uh, after Pearl Harbor and a lot of movement in Europe that was not particularly good. Uh, that it was still going to be over in a couple of months? We were so bereft of any information that I was living in a... I look back to think that... to think that I lived in an era that I never even noticed what was taking place except my own little world. And I really didn't really know the extent of, of what was going on in Europe. Did you have in your own mind personally a desire as to whether you would go to Europe or you would go to the Orient? I, I, really, I, I really never gave it a thought as far as the choice is concerned. I think that uh, if I had my choice, I still think I would have, since I only know Europe and know that, I mean, I only, since I only know the Pacific, I don't think I would have gone anywhere else. I, I, uh, I, I, I think that the, there were two wars they're talking to people and reading about people and reading my books about the world of the war. The war in the Pacific, the field of war that I was in, was a much quieter on a one-to-one -one basis than the mass assault like they had in Europe and like the landing in Normandy and things like that. We never got involved in that big action like they had, ever. Tell us about shipping out. Oh, shipping out was, uh, we were on the uh, SS, I can't remember the name of the ship now, but it was a big, enormous thing. We, did. we had almost 5,000 troops aboard there. Now, are you on the west coast? No, we no. shipped out through the, uh, through the, um, uh, through, through New York. New York Harbor. Through New York Harbor. Yeah. And we were heading for the Philippines at that time. And on the way to the Philippines, the Philippines fell. And they diverted our, our, our ship to Australia. This, this, is, this is important. Um, you were at sea to reinforce the Philippines yes. as early as what? What was the date? This was around, uh, we, shipped out the tw we shipped out in January. And, uh, of 42. 42 in January, yeah. and on the way, the Philippines fell, or else they were occupied, I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, so originally our trip, well, our, 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 recru our cruise, our, our, our job was to get to the Philippines, but once again, the Philippines fell, and they diverted us to uh, Australia, a town called Ballarat in the southern part of Australia. And uh, the thing about landing in Australia, we all had tomain poisoning. That was one of the gracious things we were, we were allowed to have. Did and you get it on board the ship, or? We landed, we got on board the <coughs> ship. Not a might, maybe about hundreds of us had it. It was a, quite a sight to see. And uh, we landed this town in Ballarat, once again set up our tents, and we stayed at Ballarat for a while. At Ballarat, 
we had a minimum amount of training. We really had very little, uh, very little training. Almost like a, uh, we were almost like a, a vacation resort for us. We stayed in town there. We got to some of the big cities. We got to. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the one of the big cities we got to, but a real big city, one of the major cities there. Would this be Melbourne? Yeah, it was Melbourne. <clears throat> the, the Melbourne Harbor was an amazing harbor. It's absolutely enormous harbor. It was the, it was almost like an ocean unto its own. And then we landed there, and then we set up our tents and so forth. One of the we were, we traveled by train for a while, and. Uh, Australia had a problem with their gauges of the railroads. The railroads had different gauges. Sometimes you'd come down one on one rail, and then you'd suddenly have to get off and change to another train because the other the, the train you were on had a different gauge than the one you were going to go on. But anyway, we survived that, and uh, we landed down there. We stayed down there. We were down there about six weeks, I think. You spoke of training down there. What kind of training did you do? Very, very little. What kind of equipment did you have? We had some, we had, at that time, we had <clears> some good <throat> rifles assigned to us. And uh, we basically had very, very little training. We had some, some uh, crawling through the, learning to crawl under, 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 under uh, barbed wire and things like that. But as far as I can see, I can honestly say that uh, training was at a minimum. It was sort of a, sort of a transition type of uh, thing. I think Australia was, something they hadn't planned to do, and we suddenly dumped uh, thousands of troops there, and, uh, and uh, none of the facilities were to get up to prepare, prepared for our, uh, our presence. That, that was my answer, my answer to it anyway. Were, were, was any part of your training uh, with, say, tanks, no. or uh, in conjunction with aircraft, or no. just you guys, the infantry? That's right, that's right. We did have supporting artillery, of course, and uh, that mortar platoons, uh, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, we had mortar platoons, mostly carrying 30, 30 millimeter mortars. That's all. We have one platoon, and uh, that was uh, that was about it. In fact, I don't recall ever having any active mortar training in in, uh, in Australia at all. I now, when I think back, I think uh, mortar training from our uh, our. Uh, platoon of mortars was uh, at a minimum, really, at a minimum. So it's just you out on a firing range? Uh, you got That's right. We did a lot of firring. Garands now by this time? No, we M still had 03. We hadn't gotten still Garands that. at that time. As a matter of fact, later on we got Garands. I was uh, one of the instructors on, uh, on how to break it apart and disassemble it and so forth. Where were you going on these trains? We'd go right from Ballarat, we'd go right, right outside the area there. It's a very sparse area, very, very, uh, just about uh, nothing there really. Very, very few, very little growth. And when we got to uh, Melbourne, of course, that was a real big, wide, solid streets, and we had a nice time in there. And you were there six weeks? About six it? weeks, yeah. yeah. Where'd you go from there? Then it was from there we shipped over to New Caledonia. You back on another ship? Another ship. Not the same one that brought you over. No, no. By the way, we were aboard ship for uh, over fifty. I think it was fifty-one days aboard the ship. Five thousand of you. Five thousand. And everything was okay. Oh, I forgot to tell you that we going across. We hit the Tasman Sea, and the Tasman Sea. We hit a huge storm. God. Everybody seasick. Oh, it was a real wild time. I forgot that part. But uh, one of the problems the, uh, with a troop ship of that size, the amount of personnel below decks is so, it was just horrifying. You're sleeping, your nose is one, three, four inches from the butt of the fellow in front of you. These ships were put together, and this was a passenger ship, by the way, originally. And it was put together in, 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 mad, mad, in marvelous time to be ready to go overseas as far as any, any, uh, any beautification or everything was very, very basic, but they did a very good job in getting all 5,000 men aboard. Anyway, it was quite a life living aboard that ship for 50 odd days. 
What sort of a unit did you feel you were in? Were you thinking platoon, uh, battalion, regiment, division? Uh, how uh, many guys moved around with you when you went? We always moved with the whole uh, the whole company. Company L, 182nd Infantry was a unit that always traveled together, and uh, they stayed with the with the Merkel Division all the time. And uh, we had two other divisions with us, and uh, we were always together. The, the whole unit was always together. What was your objective on New Caledonia? New Caledonia, actually, there was no uh, there was no military at all there. So, I mean, no military action at all there. There was a uh, there was actually a uh, almost a vacation resort. Really, we did very little there. Also, once again, this was a transitory uh, move to the next uh, island, and uh, until we went to uh, Spirit of Santos from there. And uh, so, in, uh, New Caledonia itself, basically, very little basic training. We we did spend a lot of time on on, on firing ranges. We did spend that. Mm. Uh, BAI people get used to the BARs, and uh, it's a Browning automatic rifle. Right. Yeah. I, I think at that time we did get the M1 M1s. I know I sat to teach, and we all sat to teach that. What was your rank at this time? I was a, at that time, I was a uh, corporal at that time. Did you have the feeling that the um, army wasn't ready for you yet, but it had to do something with you? Well, I felt the army had a lot to learn, and I had a lot to learn. And uh, I, think, I think the army learned as it went forward. And I think once again, experience is a is a great teacher of all of all things, army and civilian life also. Can you tell us where New Caledonia is relative to some of the uh, say Australia? New Caledonia and Australia probably be, I'm not sure, but I'm really not sure. But I would say about a thousand miles apart. And uh, it's a different area, though, completely, as far as the type of personality you're dealing with, uh, with uh, French against, uh, against uh, the, well, the Australians who were more of the uh, type like that. We were bought a, a, a coming out of, uh, now that I think of it, coming out of, I was on a, uh, an Australian ship. I forgot that part too, yeah, I just thought of that. An Australian, Australian ship which was disguised as a passenger ship. And we were aboard that ship. We, not too many of us too, maybe about a hundred men aboard the ship. Never, um, I forget what we were doing there anyway, but and then I remember we were cleaning our guns one day and we got some oil on their beautiful decks. They weren't very happy about that. Why well, was I you you say it disguised as a passenger ship. It was, it was, was this a furtive it, move it was, you were making? It was a passenger <coughs> ship that had some heavy guns aboard, looking for submarines, I think that's what looking for. How I got on that thing, I don't remember exactly, but... Uh, what was your job on, on that ship? What were you supposed to do? I don't know what we were supposed to do, really. We just, <laughs> we just <laughs> were on it. There were about a hundred of us on there, and I don't know what we were supposed to do, really. Is this the one that took you up to New Caledonia? No, no, this no. is off of New Caledonia. Went on this thing for about a week or so. We cruised and you around came back in? Yeah, and sort of. A, it was almost like a cruise for us, that's all. What did uh, they used to call a ship like that? A Q-boat or something that was disguised to be something that it wasn't? I don't know what they'd call it, but it was supposed to be a, a ship that would be attracted by a submarine and it had exactly, an action yeah. against a submarine. And it was an Australian ship. An Australian ship. I don't remember the name of it at all or anything. At any time uh, thus far in your career, had you seen any Japanese not or any time, evidence no, of not at all. Any airplanes? Anything? No, not really. Except American planes. That's all. No Japanese. Uh, we had no. We we're not under attack at any time and so forth. By the way, going overseas, we did not have an ex escort either. We were an unescorted uh, ship. We uh, did not have a destroyer escort, or we weren't in a convoy at all. We were a ship, period. 5,000 guys. 5,000 of us. Yeah. 
You mentioned that you went next to Espiritu Santo. Right. Um, tell us who owned that before. That the was a French plantation mostly, and it was, it was controlled by the French, and I think it was also owned partly by the British also. The British and the French, I think, owned it. It's no longer called Espiritu Santo. Its name has been changed now. I don't know what the new name is, but it's not called Espiritu Santos now. It was a plantation where they grew a lot of rubber, a tremendous number of oranges, of not oranges, tangerines, and um, one other thing that's, uh, that's very, very, very rare, not rare here, but it's very tasty. I, uh, I forget what it's called now. My memory is going bad to me anyway. But, but you uh, sent, you're describing a very tropical island. It, oh, it if it had a, a rubber plantation, oh, yeah, it was a tropical island. We were, were very close to the equator. <coughs> what did this, this Brookline boy think of this? I don't know. I just accepted it. You know, we were all together. I think you, when you're traveling with a group, and and you just make the move, and everyone just accepts whatever takes place as norm. That's all. You're up into forty-two now, if I'm following this correctly. Right. Um, did you hear about the progress of the rest of the war that uh, I have beyond you, your area? I have to tell you that we were in a vacuum of our own. We knew almost nothing going on except our own little war. And uh, on the Spirit of Santos, there were Japanese. And I did one, one thing, we had Japanese there. We also had uh, a lot of natives that were friendly to us. And uh, we. Uh, we did have a little action on, on the Spirit of Santa, but very, very little. We had extremely little armament. We only had, if I remember correctly, we only had 30, cal uh, 30 millimeter uh, mortars, and we had no big guns at all. And we set up a primitive defense there, and we lived there, and, uh, and uh, there wasn't much action at all, just a little bit. But describe what action there was. Is, is this the first time you'd bumped up a, first, against yeah, the Japanese? Yeah, right, Tell right. us about that. Well, I, there were many Japanese in the island. I was, uh, I was a patrol leader. My, my job basically throughout the whole war was almost on patrol all the time I did. I was always on patrol. And on patrol the first time we encountered some Japanese for the first time. We had a little action. And uh, none, unfortunately none of our men were Killed, thank goodness for that. And uh, we did. We knocked off a few Japanese, and then they disappeared. They just went into their hiding there. We never saw them again. And Spirit of Santa was a fairly good-sized island. And uh, prior to your coming, were the Japanese there building an airfield? That generally in, their advance parties were doing that. Not in Spirit of Santos, they weren't. They weren't building an airfield in Spirit of Santos. One thing uh, we had, the natives would take us out, out hunting for a wild boar, and uh, that's how the quiet things were there. And we get the boar, and they want the meat, and we want the tusks of the boar. And uh, to this day, my wife has a set of tusks that I brought back to me. She wears the Really? Boar. You still have them? Still have them, yeah. Good. It was interesting, not only me, but we all, I, I, don't, I wasn't the only one that went out there doing it. Uh, we got the boar, get the tusks, and we scrape the tusks off with a, uh, oh, I don't know what we use to scrape off the thing, and then eventually you get rid of this hard crust under the tusk, and underneath this tusk is beautiful ivory. And we take and polish the ivory with toothpaste, and I still have that. That makes sense. I have a pair of those tusks. <laughs> My wife has them today. If we're going by the calendar here, and you're getting up into, say, the summer of 42. Then we went to... You're uh, headed toward Guadalcanal, that's aren't right. you? Now, um, Guadalcanal was secured by the Marines at that time, but we still got involved in some uh, activity in, in Guadalcanal. Tell us about the first time you saw Guadalcanal. Well, we landed on the uh, on LS landing ships, and we went through the water. We went in there prepared for, an, uh, but uh, we saw no, no, uh, no real, no, no, no one uh, stopped our landing at all, and we knew at that time that we we're getting into a real combat area, but the Marines had secured it, and then we got involved in, in helping repair and build an airport. They were used these steel 
plates that we put down that would join one another to make a surface. Is this the old Henderson Field? Yes, Is that's correct. We still work at Henderson Field. What, what relics of, of the battle did you see? What did you see well, where such a lot of fighting had taken place? There was, and we got involved in some of it. And uh, then uh, I'll tell you one time, we got marooned on a hill. There were probably about two platoons got marooned on a hill in Guadalcanal, and uh, we couldn't get off this hill, and we ran out of an important ingredient, water. Now, it's one thing to be out of food, that's not so good, but in the tropics, to be out of water is worse, far worse. It was really a terrific, terrific experience being without water, and uh, we stayed up there for, we were trapped up there for a few days. By the we, Japanese, I By the Japanese. Yeah. Then we moved <coughs> out, we moved out, and we came across a beautiful thing, a small stream. And I recall everybody just sticking our heads in the water. And I said, don't, I think to myself, don't drink too much, but I couldn't stop myself. I just drank and drank. And I, it actually took about three days before our systems were back to norm again. It was a uh, quite an experience. What were you guys doing up on these hills? Well, we were actually we started looking for some nice, pleasant Japanese to contact, except we ran into a much larger force than we anticipated. But so we ended up on this high knoll. When I say a hill, I, I think that's maybe an exaggeration of the truth. It was a it's a knoll more than a hill. But we were surrounded pretty much by Japanese, and we had some casualties at that time. And what, so. ki what kind of support did you get? W was there artillery or aircraft, anything that could Nothing. Uh, help you? Nothing. Nothing. But the Army knew you were there. We think they did. We had no, we had no particular, we had no artillery support at all. I think the one of the things that, at that time, Later on, we got a little more sophisticated. We send out patrols all the time to small patrols. Our patrols, by the way, were very small. Seven men, 14 men, not, not big patrols. And we would, until we make contact with the enemy at that time, and then we'd pull back and notify the artillery and heavier force and so forth. The war was sort of a, it was such a different war than, than all the books I read and people I've spoken to who have engaged in well, the Marines and the Iwo Jima and things like that. We never experienced that at all. We really had a uh, sort of a private war going on. And from there, we stayed in Guadalcanal, and, and Guadalcanal for, we were there for, uh, oh, I'd say maybe four or five months there and so forth. That would take you up into 43 then, wouldn't it? Uh, pretty close, yeah, yeah, pretty close. You you said a minute ago that you were a, a patrol leader. Mm. Um, tell us what a patrol leader is and, and what does he do? Well, <clears throat> I spend a lot of time patrol. A patrol leader is the man who leads the patrol. He's the front man. He's the man who looks out and fix the, uh, picks the paths to go. And he, if he calls for it to go out 14,000 yards out, he go. He uses, tries to use his own judgment when he's out 14,000 yards. And if he doesn't make contact with the Japanese at that time, he's, his, uh, his, his orders were to head north for 3,000 yards. And we do that also. And uh, when sometimes it was a sort, we'd encounter the Japanese also, firefights, firefights with them on a uh, basis of, once again, not major confrontation. And we, 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 we had pretty good, at that time, we were pretty much, much <coughs> we were pretty well trained to know what, we knew what to do, and uh, we'd watch ourselves, and we'd count the Japanese, and uh, firefight, move on, move back report back that we contacted the Japanese at 14,000 yards, and then the artillery would take over once again. By the way, artillery sometimes rained on us, too. 
our own artillery. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that before, but our own artillery is probably the worst shelling we had rather than from the Japanese itself. This isn't just short rounds. Yeah. They were just dropping them in the wrong place. Right, right, exactly. When you're walking out there, um, what senses are you using? You, you must be loaded with tension and you are, very you are. extremely You're alert. Tension, alert. Yeah. But uh, how do you detect guys way out there that are hostile to you? How do you detect them? Well, let's see. I would say that you approach very, very cautiously as you come to an area. Most of the time, we're in the jungle. In fact, we're always in the jungle. So visibility isn't that great. So, but visibility on both sides is not that great. And sometimes, we, one time we encountered a, a Japanese, I don't know what size the outfit was, but we actually bumped into them practically. We were within, I'd say we encountered them within, uh, I'd say, 15 yards. All of a sudden there is a Japanese guy right there. And that was when we had a little firefight right there. Now this is late in 42. Right. So can you tell us the condition the Japanese were in? My impression or my understanding is that these guys were all pretty hungry and uh, eventually were evacuated from the northeast corner of the island. Well, if I were a Monday morning quarterback, and it's always easy to tell the play that should have won the ball game, also Monday morning you could see the game that would have won the war, I think that most of these islands that we took during the war, we didn't need. We didn't need. We could have bombed their airfields and our ships had enough surface to patrol and stop any reinforcements coming into the Japanese. But Monday morning, I'm, I'm always a good ball player. My and question was, what kind of shape were the Japanese in? Uh, the ones we encountered were okay. They were vi viable, they were moving fast, and they were maybe they were an outfit that had, uh, had survived. But uh, the ones we encountered, they were not, I never thought of being sick. We saw, saw some horrible things happen. I'm not even going to mention they were so bad, but uh, the, uh, the Japanese were, I think, were as well, well as, they, the ones we encountered were as well fed as we were, I would say. I never saw them starving and uh, Later on in the Philippines, I saw that, but here I didn't. Let's let's change the question around then. Just turn it over. What kind of shape were you guys in? Good physical shape. Were you yeah. uh, well clothed? Did you well, have all enough I, ammunition? And all, yeah, enough ammunition, enough supplies. All I wore was a pair of coveralls, a camouflage coveralls. No undergarment whatsoever. Just that. Period. Not another thing at all. And uh, boots and shoes, uh, boots and, and socks, and that's it. And, and a helmet also, we got a helmet on, of course. Were you ever in a position to call in naval support? We were at one time. And not, was it, not on Gaul Canal. Was it we readily time. available? Well, it was available, it wasn't so good. And also, once again, a lot of the rounds landed around our area too, or shot rounds too. I think at that time, I don't think the, uh, this was from the dash, uh, support at that time, uh, and this particular one I'm thinking of was aboard a, the guns aboard the ship were helping us. Now a ship firing with proper advance or someone there might be of help, but as far as we were concerned, they, they weren't that much of help to us. Isn't it kind of difficult if you're in a jungle to get, look at a grid map and figure out where you are and where you want those very, very rounds true. to land? Very, very true. So it's a uh, it's a kind of iffy thing to call in fire. Very true, very true. And, and uh, the, uh, the visibility as such is not as good as it could be. And so once again, they're different than the war in Europe. They're completely, absolutely. The jungle is a, uh, the jungle is a, was a, a terrific, uh, I don't know, I think I still like the jungle in a way. And uh, one of the things about the jungle, when you had a position in the jungle and holding a secure area, one of the things you worried about was rain. Once rain came, 
obscured any movement of anyone coming towards you. The noise of the rain, and rain down in the tropics is not like rain around here, it's a, uh, a terrific rain as Marines can testify. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the noise, well, I think that's another part, another island, I'll tell you about that too. From there we went to Fiji. Shall we go to well, Fiji now? Uh, uh, why is it you, you eventually left Guadalcanal? It was totally secured, and yeah, we do, uh, uh, so you were going to go regroup secure. Still somewhere. Japanese there, yeah. still plenty of Japanese there, but they were docile, they were way back in the thing. Yeah. Once again, a big primitive defense was the uh, thing that kept the... So you went to Fiji to regroup? Regroup and rehab, and then I bought a, bought a house there. We you all, what? I bought a horse. That's what I thought yeah. you said. <laughs> and, uh, Why did used, you buy a horse? I bought him for, uh, I think I paid seven dollars for someone. And uh, not only I, but a lot of us bought these horses and we raced them up and down the beach. There, we had a good time. There was only one thing wrong with them. These horses had no saddles. And we sat on the bareback ride, we put some blankets on there, we would ride them and race them up and down the beach. We had a good time there. You still in your coveralls without underwear? Uh, I don't remember really. I, th I, I would not be surprised if that was it. Why didn't you wear underwear? I just needed the, the looseness, the feeling, and it's all one piece of garment, and, uh, and that's it. Well, first of all, the only underwear I would wear would be a pair of shots, and this way here, I just, uh, one piece, one piece of garment, that's all. Had nothing Washington. to do with insects or humidity no, no, or no. jungle rot or anything well, else. Well, no, I just, we had malaria. I had malaria and I uh, had uh, hepatitis, but uh, everybody had things like that then. How long were you at Fiji? We were in Fiji for about uh, three months. We had got embarked on a, uh, over a we hiked across the whole island to the other side to Singatoka, a little place called Singatoka. And we hiked across there. It was a little, little village. That's all, and swamp and so forth. A lot of natives there. And then from the Fiji, from there we went to. Uh, Fiji was rest and rehabilitation. My, I, I sold my horse to another outfit of another six dollars or something like so that. So you lost a buck on the horse. Yep. <laughs> but riding that horse, God, I tell you, my, it was like sitting on a, on a pointed. His bareback, back, and poor bugger hadn't been fed too well, I think, and his spine was the uh, thing that wasn't so comfortable to sit on. Were you watching the passage of the war or the uh, trend of the war to have a pretty good idea where you were going to go next? No, no. The war, once again, was a private war, and uh, we almost, almost didn't, we almost didn't even know what was going on in Europe. We really didn't. We de really didn't know. Uh, it was an amazing thing, but we didn't know anything. Europe, about it. the European war to you guys was a, like a concept. Is that it? That, That's about it. That's about that it. The, if you heard uh, the phrase "the Battle of the Bulge," we actually, which which you wouldn't have by now, we but we almost didn't hear anything about it. It was like a. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. It was something so far away from our thinking that we weren't even. I don't ever remember talking about it with anybody. It was like, this was our war, and this was the war that the whole country was engaged in. And Europe was a... Um, that was their war. That was their war. Yeah, but for you guys then, that there, there was no grand strategy. No. It was, what island are we going to go to that's next? It, exactly that's right. That's what counted. That's right. Then we went to Bougainville. Bougainville was a, uh, that was a different war for us. These, this is another French island, right? Mm. You never saw any French there, though. No, but mm. uh, you hit uh, New Caledonia and Espiritu Santo. Now you're on Bougainville. Uh, what did you do there? Bougainville was an active fighting war for us. Bougainville was a lot of fighting for us. Bougainville, we established, and our group established a, a permanent defense of Bougainville. And we had literally lived in, we were there quite a while. And once again, our patrols, which I led mostly, and I did most of the patrols, 
uh, out of Bougainville, and uh, we built a, someone sent me, uh, I got some mail, and in the mail I had some pepper plants, some pepper seeds, and I planted the pepper seeds behind the lines on Bougainville. The soil there was probably soil that would have been there from time since the world started. And I planted these pepper seeds and these pepper seeds grew and grew and grew. And the average pepper plant around here, and I grow pepper, I have grown peppers around here, is maybe a good sized plant is 18 inches high. Well, these peppers grew to be five feet high and they were festooned with peppers. And I remember giving the, com the, the, uh, the company cook. We had a whole, uh, behind the lines, we had a whole, uh, a whole different world going on. We had a company cook, we had, had uh, grub, we ate pretty well. And I remember giving him a whole bunch of peppers to put into the, uh, something he was gonna cook out of my one pepper seed. Uh, and then, when I got back here, I thought peppers were going to grow the same way, except I'd get two peppers, and I thought I was doing good. Over there, I probably had 50 or 60 peppers out of it. The whole island could be peppers now. <clears throat> Why did anybody send you pepper seeds? I don't remember. Did I, you ask for them? I don't think so. I don't think so. I've always been a sort of a, um, always interested in gardening, but even to this day I am. And uh, I don't know how I got the pepper seeds. I don't know. Have you ever gone back to Bougainville? No. So no. you don't know the Friends status of, my, of your plants? <laughs> <laughs> Friends of mine have. I've talked to a few who've gone back to the New Hebrides and they said, don't go, Huck, don't go. What was your objective on that island? That island was just a holy island, really. And once again, to help build an airport. But the island itself was. Uh, uh, a lot of fighting going on in that island. A lot of fighting going on. We were engaged in fighting constantly. You're, you're behind your line, behind your perimeter defense, out in patrol, you would encounter Japanese of an, a numerous, not just a few, but quite a few. Uh, for us, nothing like Europe, but quite a few for us. And we actively, we lost quite a few men there. And uh, we had a well, I'll tell you one experience we had one night. It's, it's a horrible experience. I, I tell it every time I think of it, it makes me sick. We were out there about uh, platoon. There were two platoons, say about 40 men, about more than 40 men, about 60 men. And as we moved out, further out, it became dark. Dark was approaching. In the tropics, dark is it's, it's light, right, exactly right. It's light at eight o'clock, it's light at six o'clock, at six five, it's black. Well, as we got out, we ended up at this high piece of ground, high piece of ground, and there were Japanese, quite a, quite a few Japanese all around us, active firefight going on. At, at the dark came, firefighting stopped, and we were in trenches at that, we dug our trenches. And to dig a trench down there was very easy, really, as long as you didn't hit a root of a tree. The ground was nothing but like, compost, just well, not even touched by man until the, we got there. And uh, then this horrible thing happened. All of a sudden, it started to rain. And all of a sudden, it started to rain hard. And at that time, we had set up a small primitive defense of our own there. You might say a, a little bit of a, a defense of our own there. And then some of the men were screaming they're being killed in their trenches with bayonets or knives. And then daybreak started. And this is a sad, horrible, horrible thing happened. Daybreak started. And just before light came, some of our men started to run back towards uh, where we were making egress, where we were leaving the island, and our PAAR man opened up and killed two of our men, thinking there were the Japanese coming at us. God, I, I think back of that, I, I, could, I could cry. You were up there all night long then. Yeah. 
Yeah. But we lost, uh, we lost, uh, besides those two men, we lost three other men got killed also that night. Why did they start to run? What occasion no, this? They ran because they thought it was daybreak. They were leaving the island at that time. We were pulling out at that time. But this BAR man killed two of them. And I take it you got down off of there eventually and... Uh, I'll tell you what happened. We got off of there and it was a, uh, it was a tough night. And I remember getting behind the line again and I got to my tent, my pup tent where I had set up the previous nights and a few nights. And I, I fell asleep. As soon as I got there, I fell asleep. I was sort of in, in the arms of protection here. I'm behind our lines, our own troops are there. And I crawled in this tent and I fell asleep. And later on, the fellows, friends of mine told me that my body was half in the tent, out the tent. And they dragged me and put me inside the tent. I don't even remember that. Two of those fellows, by the way, are dead now. They're both dead now. Anyway, so that was a pretty active island. We had a lot of shooting and a lot of patrols and a lot of action. How long, for the whole time, how long were you on Bougainville? Three, four, five months, whatever it was? Maybe more than that. Maybe more than that. Maybe eight months or so. Eight months. Yeah. I'm, try I'm trying to keep track of time. You're it's hard for me to keep track of time. You're moving through 44 here. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we... Uh, that was a... Uh, I suspect you're headed for the Philippines. That's right. Um, you leave Bougainville. Did you, they put you on a ship. They didn't fly you guys anywhere, did no, you? No, no, no. They put us on a ship and... Uh, we landed, landed on landing craft, and uh, we landed on the Philippines, on Leyte. Leyte was a, uh, a different type of terrain in Leyte also. Leyte, once again, was out of the class of being a jungle. It wasn't a, uh, a jungle as, as Bougainville and as the Guadalcanal and other things. But Le uh, Leyte was there are natives around there as we marched into our positions. We encountered natives there and so forth. And then one day uh, uh, they came by selling uh, cigars, cigars that they made. By the way, through the war and all the patrols, people smoked cigarettes, but you could not smoke on patrol, period, absolutely not. But we all picked up a habit of chewing tobacco. <laughs> and we chewed tobacco and spitting all the time, but never, uh, no smoking. At that time, cigarettes, the danger of cigarettes wasn't apparent in the world. I mean, it was, it was not even a, uh, they issued cigarettes to us. They gave them away free. That's, that's uh, a, yeah, that's right, John. They created a lot of smokers then. Yeah. Did you, at Leyte or in anywhere in the Philippines, get close to or see Douglas MacArthur? No, never saw him. Or were you were aware of him other than yes, a yes, great yes. father I was, figure somewhere? I wasn't somewhere. aware of him, and I can tell you he wasn't well liked either. He wasn't well liked either. Well, could you tell us why? I don't know. I don't know why. I can't tell you why, really. I just, uh, I thought he was sort of, uh, sort of ostentatious in his riding around with his cubs, his corn cob pipe and uh, yeah. so forth, and the fact that uh, I shall return. And uh, but uh, I wonder if, if army in the army, navy, or marines, if always you think your your uh, commander in chief isn't the smartest one doing the smartest moves. Maybe that was it. I don't know. I can't give you the answer to that. When you landed at Leyte, was your objective? Where were you? Guys, where were you guys supposed to go? And Fight. What, uh, was, that was the main thing. Just Fight get the Japs out of the way, right. Japanese yeah. out of the way. And once again, we didn't need that island. We really didn't. In retrospect, we didn't need it. Really, didn't need a lot of them. But once again, I'm a Monday morning quarterback, and I'm um, smarter than MacArthur. But uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> we were on patrol there once again. A lot of patrols, a lot of small bound fighting. They'd lose a man, or contact a man, and so forth. 
but the uh, once again it was sort of a private war. It wasn't a uh, lot of patrols once again. Yeah. When you say private war, I I think. I think you and I are getting two different impressions from what, for what that means. You guys were part of a larger group, all set on a, a common objective. But so far as you were concerned, the ten feet around you was very important. That's about it. There, that's uh, your survival space. That's about it. But uh, that's what you're saying when you say it's a private war. That's right. Exactly right. Exactly. We have it well de well defined. Yeah. Uh, we never really saw any mass action. We never saw a thousand men moving out at one time. We never saw big, big units of the Japanese against us either. You worked at the platoon level. That's right. Yeah. Platoon level, squad level <coughs> sometimes. Squad level, a lot of times, squad level. So on a, on a uh, patrol, one time we were in a patrol on Vulcanville, and our objective was, uh, I can't remember the measurement, whatever it was, there was a second lieutenant in charge of this patrol, and there were only seven of us, seven or eight of us there. We got back, he said to me, I was the, uh, the sergeant of the patrol, he said to me, well, let's go back now. I said, we haven't come the distance yet. He said, oh, there's nothing out there. I said, we haven't come the distance. He said, there's nothing out there, we're going back. So I reported him to the captain. I said, the captain, we did not fulfill our his patrol. Well, this fellow was transferred to the quartermaster out of our company. And I was thinking to myself, my God, here's a guy who screwed up and he gets sent back to a, out of an infantry offered into a quartermaster company. Anyway. In a sense, though, isn't that somebody recognized that this guy shouldn't be leading troops in the field? Well, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. I never thought of it that way. You're right. Or else he was dishonest when, in his report, too. But I thought that it was a... Uh, I just felt a job wasn't done. I was a conscientious soldier. How long were you on Leyte? I laid late aid till I was wounded. And, can we and, can uh, we say here that you lost an arm hmm. in combat? Mm -hmm. um, and if it's Under not patrol. if Under it's patrol. not difficult for you, can you tell us about that day when you went out? Uh, as they say, this day was like all others until what happened to you that day? Well. On patrol, once again leading the patrol, came across again, next thing a machine gun opened up, struck me in the arm and the leg. The leg wasn't so bad as the arm. I fell, I fell to the ground, I got up and walked back. I walked back to our company, where, our, where we had just come from. And the men came with me with me. And I was weak, but I managed to get back, walk back. When I got back, the medic was there. And uh, I was wounded pretty badly. And uh, they put me in a stretcher and started carrying me out, four men. And then we hit Japanese again. I got off the stretcher. I spent some time off the stretcher lying down, got on the stretcher again, and finally we got to where a little grass hut was, where the, uh, where the doctors were. Now this grass hut, hut wasn't as big as this room right here. Well, about the size of this room, well, a little bigger than this room, not much bigger. I was lying there on the stretcher waiting my turn to go in the operating room, and I was wanted water, 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 and they wouldn't give me water. All they gave me was a damp cloth to chew on. That's all. And then I have to sort of forget the next part. 
because I went into that room and I woke up the next day on the island of Biak. Biak was an island, they flew me there, and not only me, but other wounded uh, soldiers also. And on the island Biak there, and that night, I was in this, I woke up and I was in the hospital bed. I went to get out of bed and I, I fainted or collapsed, I don't remember what, and I fell anyway. And they tossed me back in the bed again. And the following night, I walked to a movie, a little movie they had on. And I sat on a bench. I walked probably, uh, let's see, 100, 150 feet to this little movie they had there. But then I want to tell you what an interesting thing happened. I'm home, I'll, I'm going to skip the next part of that story, I'll come back to that, but I want to tell you a part that happened that's sort of interesting. When I was on leave, I was sent to, uh, well anyway, I was on leave. I was back in the States, I'm on leave then, and I went shopping with my mother one day. I'm in uniform, of course I'm still in the Army, the war isn't over. And all of a sudden, the fellow behind the counter came out. He said, my God, he said, the last time I saw you died. He was in the grass hut as a medic. And he said, my, I, my heart stopped beating. And they jumped upon me and pounded me and pounded me and got my heart going again. And my mother was standing there and I thought my mother was going to die right there. Anyway, this fellow was, happened to be there at that time. That small world. I know. I know. I know. Can we back up one more second to a very painful time? You've got two machine gun holes in you. You've shot in the shoulder and the leg. Did, were, did you go through triage? Did someone measure you as salvageable in terms of your life? Or uh, were you taken right into a, the medical hut and operated on there? After the, after the operation in, uh, in um, I'll, I'll tell you another theory. Uh, after the, uh, on BIAC, I had been operated on in the, uh, in Leyte, on BIAC, which was uh, still held by the Americans, but Japanese bombed it once in a while. We got bombed a couple of times while we were there. And uh, on, on BIAC, they put me in a, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the Leyte, they put me in a, a cast, a body cast stretched from my belly button up to my chest. And then they had a, uh, a unit on my arm that they were trying to force my skin over my arm, so they had this thing on me. When I was on BIAC for quite a while, this thing was the most uncomfortable thing in the world to wear. I'm here, I'm, on, I'm, I'm just about on the equator itself, perspiration is setting, and this, there's no way to wash my body, and the stench was terrible. Well, anyway, when they, they flew home, they flew us home, not only me, but I went others uh, from BIAC home, landed in Hawaii, and then from Hawaii refueled and we flew into San Francisco. On the flight, I very carefully took this whole thing and broke it off and walked off the plane without that on me. I, it was so uncomfortable, I couldn't wear it. I got off the plane and landed in Letterman in San Francisco, Letterman General Hospital, and there one of the medics is a Brookline fellow I went to school with, and he saw the entry of Haskell Sachs coming into the thing, and he came out to see me. <laughs> Smaller world. I know, I know. I still see him, by the way. I see him pretty often. Did you go home and get more medical care and uh, uh, from there uh, how did you leave the service well then? from there i was sent to the uh, atlantic city uh, the, um, the it was an amputee center atlantic city and very very and there i had another operation the other operation was an operation 
the, the operation in the Philippines is what they call a guillotine operation, and to save your life, they, they save your life, they, they just get rid of your arm, period. But in Atlantic City, I went through an operation to refine the operation, instead of the guillotine to smooth off all the wounds and so forth. So there, I was confined to bed for two weeks. Here I'd walked in, in 36 hours, walked for the operation here, I was confined to bed for two weeks. And there were four of us, three amputees from the European theater, all lost their legs, some on mines, some with shells and we were all confined for two weeks. And here I thought I was going to be out of my mind, literally. And here I, I just couldn't believe that uh, where was this more severe operation, I was walking and I saw a movie the next night and here I couldn't get out of bed. But anyway, the good thing about it is it enabled me to meet my wife at that time. How did that come about? Well, we had a woman, sort of a gray lady, who came in there and she uh, said there are four young fellows here and so my mother-in-law, my former mother-in-law, she came up and brought us some sandwiches and brought her daughter with her, who was my wife, brought her daughter with her. And since I was the first ambulatory person of the four, these other were leg amputees, they hadn't been, uh, hadn't gotten their artificial limbs or crutches yet. I, in turn, paid the respects of the four and took her out to lunch. You bet, yeah. And <laughs> two years later, we were married. And that's how I met this delightful gal. That's a good story. Yeah, it was a great story. Were you still in the armed forces? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You hadn't been discharged. No. How did that come about, your discharge? Well, once again, I stayed there for a while, and I was doing pretty good. And uh, eventually they uh, decided that it was time for me to get, and I got discharged in 1946. And I can tell you my time in Atlantic City, oh, it was called the, um, what was it called, that place? It was an old hotel. That the Traymore. They, yeah, Traymore. Have you been to that place? Traymore? I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And now it's all gambling right there. Oh, yeah. Donald Trump probably owns it. Yeah. Well, I, th I think, actually, they blew that one yeah. up and put up a tower or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So you're out of the service, but you'd been in since 41. That's right. And you got out in 46 and got to see a lot of the world and got severely injured in looking back over your military career and for the purposes of this tape um, is their most memorable experience of all the time in service one thing that stands out more than anything else I think that the one thing that stands out that there was a closeness a bond that we in our small outfit had developed for one another. There really was a, a marvelous thing that when one of us was wounded or we lost a man, it was a, almost like a blow right to our heart. I think that the, the, uh, the fondness that we felt was a, was a very nice thing, very nice thing. The war itself was a, uh, an interruption of our lives. And uh, but once again, we never, knew, we never knew what was going on in Europe. We really did not know what was going on. We never had a source of information. I don't think our officers even knew. Maybe the higher echelon did, but not the captains, lieutenants. They didn't know. From what you've been saying here this morning, you were pretty busy pretty preoccupied. That's it. We were occupied with our own yeah. lives and, and so forth. How about a person, a memorable character that comes back when you think about those years? For one of the memorable characters I just saw recently. There was a reunion we had just about a month ago. I haven't been very good in going to these reunions, but uh, Company L had a reunion about a month ago, just about a month ago. 
and the second one, this is the second one I've gone to, by the way, and actually I did not recognize a single person, not one, except fortunately they had little name tags on them. Well, this fellow that I was pretty friendly with, Dick Pratt, I haven't seen him in, in uh, well, pretty close 60 years, and all of a sudden this fellow said, his name is Dick Pratt. And I was trying to look back and think what Dick looked like 60 years ago. And he grabbed me and hugged me and I hugged him. But I was hugging a strange person because he wasn't Dick anymore. Well, I wasn't Huck anymore either. So I guess I think that uh, one of the things that I've made a point of, of never feeling sorry for myself. And I just tackle things and do things and I forget that I have one arm, that's all. I might tell you that I have one great joy is riding a bicycle. I belong to a bicycle club, a very aggressive bike club. I biked 27 miles two Wednesdays ago. And last Wednesday, I did 10 and a half miles with this group. There were 30 of us started out, 20 of, us, 20 of us finished this 10 mile run. The wind was absolutely horrendous, but I stuck to it. There's only two dangerous things from riding a bike with one arm. One is getting on the bike and getting off the bike. And Two months, month, six weeks ago, getting off the bike, I rode, I started riding this 100 mile ride for cancer. And I knew I wasn't gonna do 100 miles. I took a cell phone with me to call my wife when I got tired and she would drive down to pick me up. And my friend would go on ahead and he, he finished the 100 mile ride. And uh, uh, I fell getting off the bike up in this hill. I was getting off to get a drink of water and, and uh, getting a rest. And uh, I ended up with 20 stitches in my leg and uh, emergency ambulance and hospital and so forth, emergency room and so forth. But the following Wednesday, I rode with the bandage on and so forth. It just healed now, just closed off now. And. Uh, I just go on and on, that's all, and I... Do you, do you find that ironic, that the, the, the two severest wounds you got in your life were either a machine gun bullet or falling off a bicycle? I've fallen off bikes before. I had 17 stitches one day, another time. But uh, that's all, that's all. Huck, how important to you was serving in the military? Oh, I, I think it was important to me. I think it was important to our country. I felt as though I felt as though I loved this country, and if, if my job helped our country in any way at all, not only did I feel this way, but all the fellows felt this way. There was a, a spirit of core. There was a, a, a love of our country, and the fact that we were fighting a war that would help us win the war. Uh, I would. Uh, that was a marvelous thing, really. I think all of us felt that way. You lost an arm. Uh, you lost good friends. Um, in looking back on it, do you have regrets that override the uh, patriotic value you have placed on your experience? I wouldn't say so. I would say that uh, the loss of my arm isn't that terrible. It isn't that terrible, really. It's tough for a person who has two arms to know how a person with one arm feels or does. But there aren't many things that I, I just never, I sometimes, sometimes I literally, when I'm, I'm brushing my teeth, look in the mirror, and I suddenly see that I have one arm, I'm a little bit surprised sometimes. Even, even, but uh, I, I just go on and do things the way I, uh, I've always done them, I think. 
sometimes I know there's certain things I can't do with one arm, and I have to get a, someone has to hold something for me to do it. But uh, very, very rarely does that happen to me. And to other, other amputees, they have one arm also. I have an artificial arm too, but that's like, a, uh, it's no use to me at all, not at all. Did you try it for a while? And oh, yeah, I wore it. Just feel while. that I this isn't worth it? Or? No. If you have, uh, if in the, in, the, uh, in the understanding of amputees, if you have an elbow, that's a different story. But if you don't have an elbow, it makes it much more difficult. In my case, I tried this thing and I wore it faithfully for months and months and months and months and months, and now it's in the mothballs. I would never even consider putting it on any case, favor, or anything like that. Since the time you were wounded, shot grievously in World War II, they went on to Korea and they got the MASH hospitals, and as we became involved in other military uh, wars, the medical profession evidently got better and better because you got to hospitals and care faster. Could you characterize the kind of medical care you got, not only in the, in the Philippines, but subsequently? Has the government taken good care of you? I would say that the, uh, the Philippines action saved my life. If I hadn't had that, I, I certainly would have died. Uh, the, as far as the medical care in Atlantic City at the uh, BMPT Center there, there was very, very good, excellent care. I think they overdid keeping me in bed for two weeks, but uh, that was, at mm -hmm. that time, uh, even today, uh, people uh, go to the hospital for major operation and five days later they're home. Well, at that time, two weeks was the norm, and I guess I just couldn't quite cope uh, cope with it myself, but uh, generally seeing, I think I got excellent care really, and and uh, right to this day, I think that the the Veterans Administration has done a marvelous job of uh, taking care of any problems and so forth. So I certainly. You and I have been talking for approximately an hour and a half, a little less. Is there anything I haven't asked you today that you'd like to put into this tape? for your family or for the benefit of historians who'll be looking at this in the future? Well, my grandchildren have watched me grow up with one arm and, and uh, they just have accepted. I sail a boat. I've owned a boat up until a month ago, well, six weeks ago I sold it. I've owned it for years. I drive a car. I garden. I bike. I water ski, and I used to be. I used to run once in a while. I don't anymore. Now I have a problem, so I don't do any. I don't walk too well today. I have a hip problem. But I think that uh, all in all, I, my family is. Uh, my family is one of the loves of my life, and I enjoy all my constituents and friends I have today. And fortunately, one by one, I'm losing them also. And. Uh, but I, I have no problems, no regrets in the life I've led, and so forth. Haskell Sachs, thank you for coming John, in today. Thank you. The hour and a half passed pretty quickly.